Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to have you here. Thank you. Hey, I want to welcome those that are inside, those that are in the coffee house, those that are online campus. Uh, we are uh, just so thrilled you're making real life part of your weekend. And specifically for those of you that came last week for the very first time to one of our Easter services and thought, you know what, I might check this thing out again. We're honored that you're back. And as Kelly said, we do have a free gift for you. And we'd love for you to check out First Steps so on that connection card. You can let us know about that. And we'll get you signed up for our next one, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks. And for everybody that helped out with our Easter services last week, I just want to say thank you. Over eight services, over 13,000 people came through here. So that's pretty cool. And so we're so grateful for everybody and all the work that you did and all the ways that you made that happen. It was just a fantastic weekend. And if you are new around here, uh, I wanted to just tell you kind of how we do things here. And what we do is we typically take kind of a, a, a topic or an issue or a spiritual question that a lot of us are wrestling with. And we spend five to six weeks just kind of looking at what the Bible has to say about it and applying it to our real life. And that's kind of what we do around here. And our mission is to help you find and follow Jesus through that process. And so we're we're kicking off a brand new series this weekend called Insomnia, What Keeps You Up at Night? And over the next several weeks, we're going to walk through what the Bible says about addressing some of our deepest fears that typically are the things that keep us up at night. Now, when you think about what scares you or what keeps you up at night, for a lot of us, this really began as a child, okay? When you were growing up, something happened or you got scared enough that, you know, you were nervous about things. For instance, especially about the time that we went to bed. Now, how many of you were people that you were scared of what was in the closet, and so you needed to have the closet door open at all times, just so you could constantly be monitoring, all right? How many of you were the other side of that, it needed to be closed? Close the closet door, I don't want to know what's going on in there, and I think it won't get out if I have it closed, all right? How many of you, on the other hand, what your fear was, there's something under the bed, okay? Something under the bed, so you would check it randomly throughout the night. That's good. Well, I'll tell you what, for me, I really wasn't scared of what's under the bed until I saw a particular movie that some of my friends were kind enough to show me and scar me for life, and it had a lot to do with this character right here. That's right. Some of the rest of you are scarred as well from Poltergeist, Okay. And the clown ends up under the bed, which terrified me of what's underneath the bed, and of clowns. Did you know that's an actual phobia? Okay? Chlorophobia, proud member, right here, card carrying. Uh, terrified of clowns, they're always up to no good. And uh, every time I confess this to you all, some kind individual decides to dress up like a clown and find me somewhere. And let me just tell you, I have a, a, a license, and I, I can conceal, and I can... I'm loaded. Let me just say that, okay? Not like loaded, loaded, but I have a loaded weapon. Let me say it that way. And uh, I will go Oakland Raiders on you if I have to. So no clowns. Um, please take it away. Okay, you're giving me the willies. I know what's behind me. There we go. Okay. Now, a lot of you, maybe you don't care about clowns. Maybe you do, whatever. But you grow up and you develop other fears, okay? And they're not quite as irrational, but yet they're sometimes a little bit scary for you. If I put a picture up here and you're scared of it, would you just applaud really loud, especially those of you outside? Here we go. Here's the first one. Snakes. Anybody scared of snakes? All right. You're like Indiana Jones. You hate snakes. I get it. I understand. Okay. What about this one here? The spiders. Okay. Don't like the spiders. You know, studies show that we eat eight spiders a year while we sleep. Speaking of insomnia, okay. Sleep with one eye open. All right, and then how about this one here? Um, the dark, okay? Anybody scared of the dark? Feel you? Now, when I was growing up, I moved past that age of needing the nightlight, but I was still a little bit nervous about what was going on in the room after I turned the lights off, and so I would move my bed right over there by the light switch so that if at any time I needed to know what was happening, I'd just click on the lights, all good, go back to sleep. Well, it just so happened one particular time, I lived in Kansas, and so we'd have a lot of thunderstorms that would kind of come up. And one night while I'm asleep, we have a thunderstorm, knocks the power out, unbeknownst to me. I wake up, a little bit nervous, what's going on in the room? I go to flip on the switch, no power. I thought, this is it. <laughs> the clowns have thrown the breaker, it's all over, <laughs> here they come, you know? Now, fortunately, I survived that, but, but here's the thing, if you're scared of the dark, there's a real easy remedy for that, right? It's the light. You turn on the light, you turn on your flashlight, you turn on your phone. 
There's a quick remedy for that. But you and I both have other things that there's not a quick remedy for. There's not an easy fix. And oftentimes it's things that we stay with and it stays with us and it lingers with us and it haunts us to the point where we don't sleep at night because we're constantly thinking about these things. Now, I don't know if you have trouble sleeping at night normally or not. Maybe you're one of those that kind of needs to, you know, know what time it is at all times. My parents, they got one of those alarm clocks that you put on your, your bedside table. It's digital, and it also has a little projector on the side of it that shows the time up on the ceiling. I don't know. I mean, I guess you're so tired. You can't, you know, just, just turn your head and look. You... And you're laying on your back, so I don't know what you do if you're laying, you know, on your stomach. That's a whole other invention waiting to happen. But, but they love this thing, and they got us one. They said, oh, you're going to love it. We love it. You're going to love it. So we get this clock, and I plug it in. The thing is so bright, you know. It's like there's an eclipse going on in our room, and this thing is shining off the, the ceiling. And, and I'm looking at this, and, you know, if you start staring at a clock, you can't stop. Because you're waiting, when's it going to turn, when's it going to turn, when's it, you know, and I, I'm up like half the night just looking at the ceiling, which gives me a lot of time to think, and I start thinking about all the things that I can't fix, or I'm worried about, or I'm nervous about. Now, what's true about you and I both is sometimes we don't need a clock on the ceiling to figure that out, because you and I will stay up many hours of the night worried about what's next. Now, we've been talking to many of you over the course of the last few months in prep for this series, asking what keeps you up at night? And we've got chalkboards at the exits as you leave. You can write down some stuff there. That's kind of, we're all in this together. Write down your stuff. But, but I've got a list here of things, and maybe you can resonate with some of these things. Many of us are worried about conflict. And nighttime is the time you have that argument with somebody who's not in the room. And you always win that argument. You are crushing it. But you're just working through all the points in your mind. Many of us are worried about our kids whether it's their school they go to, the college they might not get into, their marriage, their health, the kind of country we're going to leave them, their safety. I worry about our kids as well. I worry about your kids. I worry about the kids of Real Life Church because we're out of room for them. Last weekend, we had to turn kids away at our classrooms because they were too full. It wouldn't be safe to put any more kids in there. That bothers me. We can't have that. And so we got to do something about that. And I'm going to tell you what that is in the next few weeks. We're afraid about our health. We worry about health scares and about test results and trips to the hospital. We're afraid of losing our business, losing our job, maybe being sued. We're worried about names like Hillary and Trump and Bernie and <laughs> Cruz and, and the big name of ISIS. We're scared about what might happen. We worry about our past and some of the regrets that we have. We worry about the future and things we can't control. We worry how we look to other people. We worry about finishing last or going broke or flunking a class or getting bad grades. Some of us wonder if we'll find true love. And some of us wonder if true love will stay. We worry about judgment day, whether we'll be good enough and whether our friends and family that have died before us were good enough. We worry a lot about prodigal sons and daughters. We worry about our aging parents. We worry about losing things like our mind or our health or our home or our freedom. And we worry about being alone. Isn't this encouraging? Aren't you glad you're here today, you know? <laughs> Feels like we should just all sing Kumbaya and go home, right? <laughs> See, the truth is for you and I both, we have things that keep us up at night. We just don't know what to do with them, and we need some help, and we're going to get some help. Throughout the course of this series, and I'm so looking forward to this series because I wrestle with this stuff just as much as you do, we're going to get some help for the fears that keep us up at night. And we're going to turn to God for that. And the Bible refers to him as a God who neither sleeps nor slumbers. And we're going to take him up on that. And we're going to ask him, since he's up already, if he'll take care of our worries and allow us to have the peace we need to sleep. So I hope you're here for every single one of these um, weekends as we talk through this. Um, if you're traveling, if you're out of town, watch it online. If you miss one, you can catch it up on your phone. Obviously, if you're here every week, get to turn on that little card. You get a chance to win one of the sleep aids we'll provide, and obviously the bed. But more importantly, I hope you're here every week because I think it's going to help you get the kind of peace that you really need. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this fear of, I'm afraid that something bad is going to happen to me. Every week we'll attach a different kind of fear, but for the most part, a lot of them are interrelated. But this one really speaks at, you're worried that something bad is going to happen to you. 
and you want to know, is God involved with all that? That's what we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bible, you can open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 8. Matthew was one of Jesus' followers, and he was an eyewitness to all these events, and he sat down a few years later and wrote them all out. They've been painstakingly preserved throughout the centuries so we could have you know, authority and authenticity in reading them to know these are the exact, exact events that happened. And it's going to be a, a really eye-opening experience as we see from Matthew's perspective what happened. And just so you know, kind of here's what's going on at this season in Jesus' life. He has assembled his disciples. They are basically traveling around the coastal region of the Sea of Galilee, and they're going city to city, and they'll go in there, and they'll teach, they'll perform miracles, they'll heal people, and they'll share about God and who Jesus is. And it's very exciting, but it's very exhausting. All these people are coming out, and Jesus is healing people. The disciples are helping out. They're feeding people. And one day they decide, we're going to get in a boat, and this time we're going to cross the Sea of Galilee. It's a large sea. It's a huge lake. And they're headed across this lake, thinking they can get a little bit of downtime before their next ministry stop. And so you can just imagine this setting. Jesus is in the boat. The disciples are in the boat, and they're ready for a little R&R. Let me tell you what happens from Matthew's perspective. Then Jesus got in the boat. And they started across the lake with his disciples. Can you kind of visualize this? You ever been out on a day on the lake? And these guys are in this boat, and they're telling stories. And, oh, remember that last town we were in, and that person was sick, and Jesus healed them, and then Jesus said that? I don't even know what that means, but it was cool. And, yeah, then you did that, and you fell down, and you, you know, said all these crazy things, but Jesus made up for it. It's awesome. And they're just laughing, having a good time. Everybody's relaxing. Maybe they're grilling. I don't know. And then out of nowhere everything changes. Look what it says next. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. Isn't that just the way it always is? You try to get away for the weekend, your phone rings off the hook, got an emergency back here, you got to get back. You know, you try to get a day away on the golf course and somebody finds you somehow because they need something from you. You want a nice weekend away to staycation at the house, and they track you down and knock on the door, or everything falls apart. You just can't catch a break. And that's where these guys are. And suddenly the storm comes in, and it begins to bring this huge amount of rain and wind upon them, and it's just ending their ability for a little rest and relaxation. In fact, Matthew wants us to know how bad this storm is. He's right there in the middle of it. He's watching the storm. He's seeing the waves come over the side of the boat. He's seeing everything floating around at the bottom of the boat. He's taking mental note of this. And when he sits down to write all this down a few years later, he uses this word that we just have translated as storm. But in the Hebrew or in the Greek, I should say, what it actually is is seismos. Recognize that word from seismologist? This is a huge event of earth and sky and sea. This is all the elements he can see just revolting around him. And he only uses this word about three times in his writing of Jesus' life. Here, the day Jesus was crucified and the whole earth shook, and then the day Jesus came back from the dead and the graveyard shook as the stone was rolled away. This is a big word because this is a big storm. And I got a feeling you and I both know that feeling of a storm in your life. It comes upon you. It's big. It's loud. It's cataclysmic. You don't know what to do next. You might have a panic attack. You're freaking out. And not only that, it's suddenly. It's without warning. No one tipped you off that this might be coming. It's like you went to the doctor for a routine exam and now suddenly you have a bunch of tests coming up and they don't know what the problem is. You went to the mail just to pick up your mail and you get a letter from the IRS and everything's about to change. You open an email from a trusted friend only to figure out they're no longer someone you trust anymore. It's sudden and it's a storm and it's attacked these guys. In fact, Mark will tell us in his version of this story that it was so bad the disciples thought they were all going to die because they didn't have any life vests Water's taking in the boat. They're about to be swamped. They don't know what to do next. They're losing it suddenly. Here's what I find very interesting about this. Notice this. The disciples, the guys in the boat, are the good guys. They're obeying Jesus. Jesus says, get in the boat. They get in the boat. And now suddenly they're about to lose their lives. I mean, think about that. If there's anybody 
that should have a peaceful river cruise, it's these guys. They're the good guys. They're with Jesus. They should float out there to the middle of the lake. It should be just glass all around them. A rainbow should appear over the top. Doves should be released and spell out the word, you are precious. You know, it should just be a Hallmark card for these guys. They're Jesus' friends. But instead, it's just the opposite, which means that you need to understand this. Just because you're following Jesus doesn't mean that life suddenly is storm-free. And apparently, in this case, you're going to get soaked and scared to death. And maybe some of you already felt that. Maybe a couple weeks ago, you were baptized, and now things have just seemed to have gotten worse. Some of you started tithing and giving your resources back to God, and suddenly things got difficult. Or maybe you just started coming to church last weekend, and you come back, but there was great difficulty getting here. You just need to know that following Jesus does not mean the absence of storms. But it does change the way we weather them. You see, Christians still battle diseases. Christians still fight temptations. Christians still bury their children. And Christians still get cancer. The question is not whether we have the storm. The question is how we weather it. And Jesus is in the midst of their storm as bad as it gets. And he's the most calming, non-anxious person on the boat. Cool as a cucumber which raises this question. Where's Jesus? Take a look at what Matthew tells us next. But Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> I often wonder how Matthew wrote this. You know, if there's a little bit of sarcasm in this, if he'd had emojis, would it have been, the, you know, the clenched teeth or the, something like that, you know? What, have, what would have happened right here? Jesus is asleep during this. And you're probably wondering, how is he sleeping through all this? Well, the boat was so big. They had compartments up at the front where you could kind of escape the elements if you needed to. And Jesus had laid down in one of those, taking a nap because it had been such a busy stretch of time for him. And he's just sleeping all through it. Well, the disciples, they're not sleeping. They're freaking out. Take a look at what happens then. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. I mean, these guys, they've been, they've been you know, using buckets, getting water out of there, and it's coming in twice as fast. They're drenched. They're screaming at each other. They're yelling. I mean, these are fishermen, too. They should know that they could weather this, so it's a bad storm. And they go, and they get Jesus, and they open up that hatch, and Jesus, and they're probably shaking him to get him up. Now, if all you ever see about this story is what they show you in the Jesus movies, that's a little bit different. I mean, the, the Jesus movies, it's really calm. There's a gentle, you know, rain falling, and the disciples walk over, Lord. <laughs> it's always in a British accent, too, you know? <laughs> Lord, we are about to perish. <laughs> Cheerio, top of the morning, up. That's my best British accent, and I just can't stop it for some reason. Anyway, they, they wake him up, and it's probably screaming at him and yelling at him, would you get up? What is going on here? Because they want to know, why are you allowing this to happen? They want to know, as Mark tells us, don't you care that we're about to drown? That's a bigger question. In fact, notice this about this story. Fear causes us to question not the existence of God, but the character of God. You see these guys? They did not ask, are you strong enough to stop it? They know he's strong enough. They do not wonder about his knowledge of the storm. They know his knowledge is good enough. But what they wonder is, does he care? And that is exactly how I feel at times. God, I know you're big enough. God, I know you're strong enough. But if you, if you were caring... Wouldn't you do something about it? Isn't that what you think when you see the struggles in your life? As your family slowly falls apart, as your finances fall apart, as your career seems to be ending, and you're facing this storm and you don't know why, don't you wonder, God, if you could, you would. So is it because you don't care? You see, this question of our fear erodes the character of God in our mind and we begin to think it's not that he's not there it's just that he doesn't care but Jesus stands up 
proves to be the calmest person on the boat. And look what he says. Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. It's like he answers his own question here. Why are you so afraid? You just have so little faith. And then look what he does. Then he got up. He rebuked the wind and the waves. And suddenly there was a great calm. Can you imagine how that went down? Jesus gets up and just starts talking to the wind. And they're looking at each other like, what's he doing? I don't know. He's Jesus. He can do what he wants to do. <laughs> I'd rather he help us bail some water right now. Well, I don't think that matters to him. And he just speaks to the storm, and it stops. I got a feeling these disciples were no longer scared of the storm, but they were scared of who they're with. Who is this guy? And Jesus begins to get at something far deeper in our lives. The whole issue of how he handles our fear. I want you to notice something about this passage we just read. He spoke to the disciples first and then to the storm. I mean, when I start freaking out about something, I go to God and say, I need you to fix this. And here's the names and here's the places and here's the amounts and here's what needs to happen right now, God. It's all on paper for you. Do it. But it's as if God says, whoa, 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 whoa. We'll, we'll get to that. But right now, let me calm the storm in you before I calm the storm around you. Jesus speaks to the disciples first, then to the storm, which is the model he uses for us. I don't know if he will always calm the storm around you, but I do know he is capable and caring enough to calm the storm within you every time. The question is, will we allow him to do that? Some of you right now are going through a storm. You're facing it with friends, with family, in your own life, with an addiction that keeps coming back, with a financial issue, with concerns about the future, with your kids going their own direction, with your parents fading away, whatever it is. Peace comes when we realize that Jesus is in the boat with us. That's it. And for these guys, for the disciples, they are spoken to first, then the storm. Take a look at this. Peace comes when you realize that Jesus is in the boat with you. And that's it. You see, Jesus then begins to get to something that's the heart of all this matter when he asks these guys, why are you afraid and where is your faith? And he begins to kind of let us know the two words that are in competition for each other. And it's these two words of fear and faith. When our fear is high, our faith goes low. But when our faith goes high, our fear goes low. You see, some people would tell you, if you have faith, you'll have no storm. But that's not true. Jesus is in the middle of a storm. The disciples are in the middle of a storm. The apostle Paul faced storm after storm. All the saints faced all kinds of storms. That's not the issue. And so if you've ever heard a pastor say to you, you just need to have more faith and then you won't have any problems, they're wrong. The problem is not that you're going to have no storms. If you have faith, you'll know how to weather the storm and you'll have less fear. And then there's this also notion of if, I have to, if I'm going to have faith, then I have to have no fear. But that's not true either because a little bit of fear is actually good for you. A little bit of fear helps you make good decisions and also helps you rely on God. I mean, personally speaking, I have fear every single time I come out here to teach. I've been doing this for many years over multiple weekends and multiple services, but every single time I get that tense kind of feeling. I just do. But that's kind of a healthy kind of fear. Now, if I was in the back room curled up in the fetal position, you know, <laughs> sucking my thumb saying, please, I don't want to go out there, that's another thing. That only happens like once a month, you know? So, <laughs> but it's natural to have a little bit of fear. But what Jesus is saying is, why are you so afraid that you have no faith? And what we want to get to is where our faith goes up and our fear goes down. So let's talk about what it means to live fearful for a moment. 
Because many of us know exactly what that's like. All of us know what that's like, and it's awful. Isn't it just awful? I mean, there's a good kind of fear that's like a fun fear, like, oh, I'm just getting on X2 over at Magic Mountain, and this is scary, but this is fun. Then there's like a healthy kind of fear, like you're in college and all your buddies are going, do it, do it, do it. And you're like, I don't know. That's a good kind of fear, you know. But then there's a bad kind of fear, the kind of fear that robs you of your life, the kind of fear that's like Cousin Eddie and rolls into your driveway in his RV and says, you know, he's going to be there for a month, that kind of fear. And it cripples you and it just robs you of life and you don't want anything to do with it. And you know what I've noticed about that kind of fear? is it's very hard to follow Jesus when you're living in that kind of fear. Because you become risk-averse. You get stingy with everything. You're nervous about everyone. You trust no one. And you just stay put. It reminds me of my dog. I have two dogs. One that I really like. And the first one, I'm kidding you, I like them both. They're watching at home. The first one... (laughs) My oldest one, his name is Charlie, and he's a small dog, but he loves to go for walks, and we'll take him out for a walk. We'll take them both out, and he just leads the way. He's just running, you know, and we're keeping up with him, and then sometimes we take a turn, and then he's following us, you know, but there is one place he will not go, and that is the storm drain on the edge there by the sidewalk and the curb and the street, and I have no idea why, but he will not walk over it or anywhere near it. And it's not like he's fallen down one before. It's not like he's talked to his friends and they've told him tales of what happens down there. <laughs> I don't think he can read where it says this leads to the ocean, you know. But as soon as we get near it, he, he locks it up. And he won't go anywhere near it. I've got to pick him up and move him around it or go all the way around it, you know. He does not follow well when he's scared. And you know what? Neither do I. And neither do you. Because fear cripples us. And it's never done anything good. It never leads to anything good. It just makes us question the character of God. And maybe that's how some of you feel like your life is right now. You would give your life to Christ if you weren't so fearful. You would get baptized if you weren't so fearful. You would start to give generously if you weren't so fearful. You would volunteer if you weren't so fearful. You would get in a life group if you weren't so fearful. You would go on a mission trip if you weren't so fearful. You would show up on Monday nights and help out with the homeless if you weren't so fearful. But it robs you of being led by God. This is where we want to go, to the place where we're filled with faith. To literally let Jesus kind of sweep over us like a magnet and draw out all those little shards of fear out of our lives to all that's left is our willingness to follow him. That's what we want. And that's what Jesus wants for you as well. In fact, listen to what author Max Lucado says about this. Fear will always come knocking at your door, but you don't have to invite him in. For crying out loud, don't give him a place at the table and don't give him a bed for the night. In other words, fear lives with us way too long. Can I give you the antidote for all of this? And that is that prayer is our best weapon against fearful living. That's it. And it's not a magic set of words. It's not magic prayers. It's just talking to God and giving him our fears. Several years ago, when my oldest daughter, Lindsay, was pretty young, uh, we would put her to bed, and my wife and I would go sit down and watch TV for a little bit. And it was not uncommon for Lindsay to start yelling one of our names to come in and just, you know, deal with something. So one night, we're sitting there, and I hear this, Dad! So I go into Lindsay's room. Yeah, what is it, hon? I'm scared. I said, is it the clowns? Are they back? Because <laughs> they live under your bed, you know. I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> she said, Dad, I'm scared. I said, what, what's the problem? And she said, I'm scared about you and Mom dying. Said, oh, hon. I said, okay. So I have a few options here of what to say. Option one is I just go complete reality. Well, it's going to happen. I'm going to die, mom's going to die, you're going to die. In fact, let me just, let me just say what I saw on the news, okay, because that'll make you think, you know. Or I could go Disneyland on her and say, you know what, no one's going to die, everybody's fine, don't worry about it, we all live happily ever after, go to sleep. I couldn't do that. So for some reason, I was just like, God help me remember this verse from years ago. I said, hon, there's this, there's this verse in the Bible that tells us what to do with our fears. She said, what's that? 
I said, remember when we used to go fishing with Grandpa and we'd, and we'd take the, the pole and we'd, we'd cast that line way out there? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Well, the verse says, cast all your fears on him because he cares for you. And it's, if, it's as if it's our job to cast, it's his job to catch. So why don't we just kind of write our fears down in our hand and we're just going to cast them out to God and he's going to catch them. Okay. So we practiced that a little bit, and I left the room, you know, and she's working on that, throwing those out there. It's one of those moments you walk away and think, I, th I think I got that one right. That one worked out all right. But it wasn't long after that that I just forgot all about that. And that's been the story of my life, being able to tell somebody else how to cast their fears on God but not being able to do it myself. So last week was Easter week. It's a great week, Right? For a church staff, it's, it's exhausting. Not just because of all the services, but because there is a spiritual battle going on where the enemy does not want us to succeed. And we have more sickness, crazy things happen, drama evoke, and, you know, things pop up all over the place. We were dealing with all of that. There was some brouhaha on Facebook about a giraffe, and I was scared about that, and picketers, and what if a giraffe gets loose and runs up and down the neighborhood trampling people, you know? <laughs> They're such a violent creature, you know? <laughs> but I'm sitting backstage before Easter begins, and I'm just thinking about all the things that could go wrong, and I just, I just think about that verse again. I just start casting my fears on God, just casting them out there. It was as if at that moment I heard this word from God, and it wasn't an audible voice. And it wasn't from far away, like from the heavens, telling me what to do. But it was like right next to me. And it was like God was saying, I'm right here. And maybe what you need to know as you go through the storm in your life is God is not somewhere else. God is not absent-minded. God is not shouting orders from across the lake, but he is right in your boat in the middle of your suffering walking you through it. And if you let him, he will calm the storm in you regardless of if he calms the storm around you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a God who is involved and that you care and that you love us and you walk with us and you lead us. So, God, we are nervous, we are scared, we are apprehensive. It makes us avoid risk that could help other people or ourselves even, and certainly our relationship with you. And so, God, we want to take those risks knowing that you walk with us. I want to pray right now, God, for those who have never decided to say yes to you for the first time, and that maybe today is the day they do that. And if that's you, I invite you just to pray these words with me, Jesus. I'm asking you to be the leader and the forgiver of my life. Inviting you into the boat. <laughs> and I'm making you the captain. You're in charge. It's my desire to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. And God, I thank you for that promise that's for every single one of us, for the grace and the mercy that you give and provide. We thank you for all that you do. And now we just want to take some moments to think about what you did on the cross. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to move into a time of communion. I invite our ushers to go ahead and come down and begin to pass the trays. If this is new to you, you can take a, a pass on it. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, this is our chance once again to remember what Christ has done. And we continue that by taking communion together. Now, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to ask everybody to take out the little elements of communion and just hang on to them. And then here in a moment, we're going to take them together as a church family. And if you're outside, we'll be passing baskets out there, and you can grab onto those and, and hang on to them. But as those baskets and, and trays are being passed and you're collecting the communion, I'm going to read to you one of my favorite psalms that just really deals with where God is in the midst of our fear. And just listen to this as we take and hang on to our communion. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. 
Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Let's take that little piece of cracker which reminds us of the body of Christ that was broken for us, and let's take and eat. And then let's take this little cup of juice that reminds us of the blood of Christ that was shed for us and take and drink. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the sacrifice your son made so we could be free of all of our sin, our guilt, our shame. We thank you that we are no longer slaves to fear because we are now your children. God, we want to be free of these things. We want to learn how to do more than just sleep at night. We want to live free. So God, thank you for making that possible. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to move into our time of offering now. It's another way we celebrate around here. And we do clap because we know that it's more blessed to give than receive. And we love hearing where our money goes around here. And there's so many great things that it does around the world. Specifically right now, your funds are going to help a group of people that have gone over to Haiti to work with one of our orphanages over there and taking care of kids right now as we speak. And so you'll want to be in prayer for them as they're over there and as they return in about a week. Every week you give around here, your resources go to help other people and to literally change their lives, both locally and globally. And so I tell you that to encourage you, but to also say thank you. And I recognize when we talk about fear, there is this sense that a lot of us have of I can't give and I'm too nervous and I don't know if I can trust God. But when we do give, it's like God releases that stranglehold on our heart. In fact, it's like this feeling of if scarcity is the disease, then generosity is the cure. And so however you give around here, whether it's through the offering bags or, or through the envelopes that you give here or mail in or using the black boxes as you leave or perhaps even through the texting in or the app, however you do that, it goes to bless so many people. So I'm going to pray for us. And the band's going to play this great song that sums up that psalm that I just read. And then we'll receive our offering during that time. God, thank you for what you've given to us. And now we give back a portion to you to say thanks. Use this to advance your kingdom. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.